Dr. Craig Broderson. Uh, Dr. Broderson did his undergraduate and master's degrees at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, then he did his doctorate at the University of Vermont, which gives him a connection to the school because his major professor was Tom Vogelman, who was the son of Tom Sycamore's uh, major professor at Vermont. Probably only the faculty remember Tom Sycamore, but he was a legend around here and a great field ecologist and very important in the Hubbard Brook project that we had for a number of years. And then Dr. Broderson uh, did postdoctoral work at the University of California, Davis, in Santa Cruz, and then he joined the faculty at the University of Florida. I should also say he grew up in Ames, Iowa, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Ames, Iowa, because that's the home of Iowa State University where I did my academic work. And in, in 2014, uh, Craig joined FES as assistant professor of tree physiology and ecology, and uh, he does very interesting work. Uh, he studies plants, and as you all know, without plants there's no life on this earth as we know it. And he studies two of their major factors for plant growth, uh, light and water. And he's pioneered in some very interesting techniques like uh, high-resolution computed tomography to parse out the exact details of the vascular systems. And so without further ado, it's really a great pleasure to introduce a, a great young scientist, Dr. Craig Broderson. Thanks, John. All right. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. All right. We're good. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and, and uh, good afternoon. And it's a, a real, a real pleasure and a privilege uh, to be here talking to you. And it's been almost four years, uh, almost exactly, since the last time I was up on the stage, uh, talking that, about the work that I do. And as uh, if you came to Justin Farrell's talk last week, uh, one of the the first thing that he that he mentioned was just the impossible task of trying to sum up four years. Um, of work, and especially um, in, in, uh, in here, and in, in all the different kind of projects that we've been doing, and as everything in our research program is starting to ramp up, involving many, many different labs and different groups from around the world, um, our lab has sort of turned into this central hub um, of research, in particular related to, to leaves and how the vascular systems of plants and how they work. Um, because we've been able to leverage this technology that we developed um, starting about 10 years ago now, um, and so uh, uh, many of you are already familiar with uh, some of the work that we do, um, primarily related to the, the organization of the vascular systems in plants, the plumbing of plants, how water and carbon move um, throughout the plant. In particular, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time focusing on stems um, and trunks and things like that and related to the, the, the functioning of the vascular system and what that means um, when, and, what, and what, what it means when the vascular system becomes dysfunctional perhaps during uh, a, a, a situation of, uh, related to drought. We had a, a nice review paper that recently came out uh, uh, on this topic, and sort of the, called the triggers of tree mortality under drought, um, and primarily focusing on with this this new intense uh, research focus on the vascular system of plants. And a lot of that research is related to uh, what's going on in the trunk or the roots of the tree. And today, what I wanted to do instead of kind of rehashing all of that uh, material that uh, that is all very very interesting um, and fun, uh, what I wanted to do today is talk about sort of the new what, what I think are the new frontiers. What we've been doing recently, um, in particular related Related to leaves and the structure of leaves, and 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 tell you sort of where we're going, where uh, where we're going, and some one of the kind of the major uh, uh, findings that we've come up with uh, recently to sort of describe uh, how nature works. All right. So when we think about leaves, right? So I, uh, Graham uh, uh, gave a nice lead in here to this first slide that I have. Um, and without plants, right, the the life as we know it is completely different. Um, and so some of the uh, kind of underlying fundamental principles of being a plant um, if, uh, is that there's uh, there's a cost to being a plant. Um, plants need carbon, right, and in, in the process of photosynthesis to grow. Um, doing that photosynthesis, they produce sugar. Uh, and that sugar then can, then can be used as this really malleable molecule uh, to put together cellulose and all the different parts that we know of a plant. And they, I mean, the sugars can go and you can make new leaves, you can make new trunk uh, material, your trunk can get larger and larger. If you're a tree, you can make new roots. Um, and you can do all sorts of different things with this very simple molecule, but it costs something, right? And right now, the exchange rate, more or less, um, just to give you a general idea, if you're an, if you're an economist and you're interested in, in knowing how much it costs to make something, right, or how much it costs to buy something, um, this is, this is the exchange rate, rate right now, and it's 400 water molecules um, are lost from the leaf 
for every one water molecule that the, that the leaf takes up, right? So it's expensive. It's expensive to be a plant in terms of water, right? This is the, the, the lim one of the major limiting resources uh, for, for plants and productivity. Um, and one of the, 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 the most striking relationships is that, and therefore, the more water you have, the more water that a plant can deliver to the canopy, move from the soil up through the roots and the trunk and into the branches and then out through the petiole and ultimately into the leaf, um, means more growth, right? So there's the direct relationship uh, between those two. Uh, and this is really important, this exchange rate, even though it kind of sounds bad for plants um, in terms of how expensive it is in ter uh, for water um, and all the investment that the plant goes to in order to build a very uh, robust and, and, and uh, sprawling a, a root system in order to extract as much water from the soil profile as possible and then transport it hundreds of feet at times up into the canopy um, is that there, there, a lot of water is lost to the atmosphere. About 95% of, the uh, of the water that is taken up by the roots just goes straight through the plant and out into the atmosphere. And the plant uses maybe about 5% of the rest of that water. Um, uh, for, uh, for doing things like photosynthesis and respiration, right? And so about 60% of the terrestrial precipitation, so all the rainfall and snow that comes onto the ground um, in terrestrial ecosystems is actually put back into the atmosphere by plants. So the rest, of the, the other 40%, more or less, uh, goes, run, is runoff, right? Goes into streams, uh, rivers, uh, lakes, and oceans, right? So the plants play a really, really uh, 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 critical role, right? And some plants, if you go down to the tropical rainforest and you've got some of these really big canopy trees, um, 300, up to 300 gallons of water per tree per day, right? So almost if you multiply that out, um, 300 gallons, and that's about eight pounds a gallon. So it's almost literally a ton of water every day for one tree. And so that's why, and, and, and as a consequence, our, our, our environment looks, looks very different than it would um, if there were no plants and no trees. So trees are sort of on our mind at this time, at this time of year as we're kind of getting into this, um, uh, this fall foliage season. And so if we take a look back um, and start to look at, at a forest. And so this is, this is Yale Myers sort of looking across one of the reservoirs um, and looking at the forest. And so if you look at it from this perspective, you see what? You see a lot of green, right? There's a big lake. Um, but you also see a lot of green, see a lot of leaves. And if you start to look um, at the leaves, and this is just kind of a sampling of, of different species that you might find uh, in a forest in New England. Uh, one of the things that, and I'm going to say something now that is, um, and I want you to just kind of follow along with me, um, but even though, right, we, we, we recognize the, the, all the different species diversity and the different leaf shapes that leaf, leaves can have, um, but one of the things that's troubling to me, uh, and I think a really good way to think about plants, is that, you know, okay, there is some diversity here in the way that they look, but they're basically all the same. So some people are gonna, that, that study plants or taxonomists are going to get really upset and angry because they use all of these little traits right, to, to differentiate between, to identify which species is which. But in general, like, you know, for the most part, at least in the flowering plants, they all kind of look the same. They're flat and they're green, right? So just a green, flat sheet. Um, and unless you start to look at other species, like the, uh, the conifers um, that are kind of round and pointy, right, you can basically break leaves down into the either thick, like maybe a cactus, right? So that's just kind of a big, um, a big leaf, and it's sort of a barrel shape. But then if you start to get away and look in kind of temperate regions and outside of the extreme climates, um, everything is sort of following this, this same pattern. It's just a flat green sheet. Um, and that raises an interesting question. Um, and even if you start to look at, uh, look at all the different leaves and you look at compound leaves and you look at all these leaves with different, uh, different margins, they're all sort of still following that same flat green sheet template which I think is really interesting. And then so that leads us to a very broad question. We'll kind of narrow down our questioning as we go through the talk. Um, but that leads to a very broad question is why does a leaf actually look like a leaf? Right? Given the amount of species diversity, 400,000 different species of plants, and sure, you can have a really large leaf, right, up you know, a meter squared and those big elephant ear leaves that grow down in the tropics, or you can have one of those teeny tiny little scale leaves that's on a juniper, for example, right? Several orders of magnitude and size. But in essence, they are all just a flat, green sheet, right? Thin, flat sheet of green, right? Why, right? Why is that? So let's just take a look at one leaf, and this is interesting that Graham, I didn't know that Graham was gonna introduce me today until he got here, and Graham has been working on red maple for a really long time, and red maple is just the, the leaf that I decided to choose to just take a look at. We're gonna just pick one of those leaves, uh, and we're gonna look at it carefully and think about why a leaf might look the way it does, right? So it's all the flat green sheet, and there's some differences in kind of what the leaf margins look like. But in general, right, there's the, 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 the shape and the form of a leaf is relatively constrained, um, given if you, look at an, if you look at animal systems, animals look really, really different, right? Um, but when you look at the leaves in a, in a forest, they're all kind of the same and all working from the same format. And I understand that there's a lot of um, important variability here. 
um, but for the sake of argument and following along with me, we'll just think about what it takes to be, to be a leaf and how you would go about building a leaf um, <clears throat> moving into the future. And I'll talk a little bit why uh, thinking about things in this way are probably going to be important uh, uh, long term for us as humans living on a planet with perhaps 11 billion um, of us sharing the exact same resources uh, with a very limited, uh, limited set of species that we like to eat. All right, so a leaf needs to be good um, at... Uh, at being productive, right? So a plant is going to spend, uh, there's going to be some cost that goes into making this leaf. It needs to be good at uh, uh, light acquisition. It needs to be good at energy uh, uh, conversion, right? So it's pulling photons out of the sky uh, and then turning that into something that the plant can use, right? So a plant needs to be good at that. And a plant also needs to be good at transporting things, so moving things around. So it needs to be able to transport water into the leaf. If you start to look at leaves carefully uh, and hold them up to the light, for example, as everybody walks out of the room uh, and, and sort of walks and goes on their way, pick up a leaf um, and hold it up to the light. And, and you'll see this really intricate venation network, right? So this is the transport system of the plant that's delivering all of that water, those 400 water molecules for every CO2 molecule that's coming in. And that CO2 has to come out, right? In the form of sugar, it's got to get out of the leaf, right? So this is just a transport problem. And so even if you're not a plant biologist or a physiologist um, or a biologist or an ecologist in any way, if you're an somebody who's into urban planning, for example, um, we can learn a lot, probably learn a lot from leaves, right? So this is the vascular system of a red maple leaf scant, zoomed in, and this is a city map of New Haven, right? So you have the same thing. You've got a big major vein, and then you've got some secondary veins that go out and, dr and deliver water exactly where it needs to go. This is I-95 kind of running through. Um, Kew Bridge is over there somewhere. And I'm not saying that New Haven has the best um, uh, best uh, uh, highway system, right? And then so, but, but plants have a several hundred million years um, advantage in in figuring out how to how to distribute uh, distribute resources in a very efficient way. But if you go through New Haven, you can get off the highway, and then you get off onto these side streets, and then and then smaller and smaller, smaller service streets, right? So there's a lot of parallels actually, and probably a lot of things that we can learn um, learn from plants, and in terms of distributing resources and moving things around. So a plant needs to be good at those two, a few, th few different things, getting water in, getting carbon out, but at the same time, it's got to be good at doing a lot of other things. And I think one way to look at a leaf, and the, why, the reason that a leaf looks the way that it does, is you can think of it in terms of a plant and its sort of journey through evolutionary time <clears throat> and the resolution of the sort of these tensions that arise uh, between kind of a multidimensional demands um, of leaf form and function, right? So it's got to be good at leaf absorption, so it might be getting tugged in a certain way um, through natural selection, and it needs to be flexible and it needs, to, uh, and it needs to be durable, as we all saw yesterday with the wind that was blowing around and the rain that's coming down, right? Those leaves are, are flopping around, and there's, the, there's a lot of kind of mechanical trauma that's happening, and then as soon as the wind dies down and the sun comes out, they have to be up and running again. This little factory has to be up and running again um, very, very quickly, right? So they need to be good at CO2 absorption, they need to be able to suck CO2 out of the air, um, essentially be a sponge and, and pull CO2 uh, out of the atmosphere. They need to be good at water transport. There's phenological um, considerations in terms of leaves coming out in the spring and coming off um, and being shed in the fall. And so there's all sorts of kind of mechanical, strength, uh, mechanical constraints. And they also have to be good at not being eaten by other organisms, right? So they have to do, leaves have to do a lot, right? And they have to do a lot of different things. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out which one, of these, uh, which one of these is most important or what are the kind of the constraints of putting together a leaf and whether or not a lot of these traits that we actually look at in leaves um, are meaningful. And Marlise, I think she's here. So Marlise and I get in this argument all the time um, about whether a trait is functional or not, right? So her students are in dendrology and you're trying to key out different species and say, okay, this, te this, this particular species has a lot, you know, toothy leaf margins. Well, does that actually mean anything for the physiology of the, physiology of the tree or not? Um, and so... I think there's, there, there's a lot that we can learn from each other um, in kind of thinking about leaves in very different ways. And one of the problems, I think, with our field, um, plant physiology sort of broadly under that big umbrella, is that the people that study water transport or the, the people that study CO2 absorption um, or light processing in particular don't often sit in the same room. They're not communicating to each other. And so what we've tried to do um, is, is kind of curate a, in, uh, a, a way of bringing together lots of different people, lots of different labs that have very specific questions about the way that plants work and and thinking at bringing them together. It's sort of like a, kind of a, 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 another version of FES where we have people from many different fields coming together thinking about the environment um, from, very different, from very different perspectives. Okay. So 
how to build a leaf, right? So it needs to be good at photosynthesis, capturing light, moving water, acquiring CO2. It needs to be good at getting that sugar out. This is something that people often forget. We often focus on just, oh, the, 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 the leaf veins are really, really interesting, and it's patterns, and um, they're really, uh, uh, the, and, the, and the leaf and the vein density and things like that are really important um, for transporting water, but they're almost you know, equally important um, for getting the sugar out. If the sugar doesn't get out of the, doesn't get out of the leaf, then all of the water import doesn't matter. Um, they also need to be self-supporting structurally, and we'll talk about that towards the end, which is actually really, um, a really, a really cool area thing that we're working on uh, recently and really neat interdisciplinary pro uh, um, project. And then they also need to be cost-effective. So in terms of an, uh, an economist, um, there's, been a, there's kind of been a running narrative for the last um, uh, decade or so in this leaf economic spectrum. So thinking about leaves in terms of how much do they cost, how much do they, how much do they cost to operate, and then how much do they bring in? What's the net gain, um, uh, uh, what's the net gain for a tree in terms of um, the carbon, water, and nutrient investment, right? So thinking about all these things, and, and this is you know, all the different constraints that a plant is under uh, in, in putting a leaf together. Okay, so what constrains leaf form and function? And we can consider two different possibilities, right? So just, just two at the, for, the, for the start. And thinking about these two properties, um, and then trying to think about looking at a couple of different case scenarios, um, and trying to figure out why leaves look the way they do. So this, this first consideration here is that 400 to 1 ratio, right? So plants are going to need a lot of water um, in order to pull in CO2. So we're going to think that leaves are probably going to be built around, or leaves that are going to be more and more efficient over time, are going to be built around putting together a vascular system that is very, very efficient, right? So the more water that a leaf can pull into the, uh, the more water a leaf can pull into it and then out into the atmosphere, the more CO2 it can gain. And the other one that's really interesting, and this is just a fundamental uh, biophysical principle, that CO2 diffusion, so the diffusion of carbon dioxide, is 10,000 times slower in water compared to air, right? So if you have CO2 bouncing around in the atmosphere and it here, um, it's you know, the, the diffusion of CO2 into my, into my liquid water here is going to be, or the diffusion of CO2 through that liquid water is going to be 10,000 times slower. So there's some things that this is, this is a really big um, uh, 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 fundamental biophysical constraint that is probably pushing um, uh, plants to look uh, the way that they do. All right. So one of the interesting things that's happened, <clears throat> and this is, comes from uh, the uh, kind of the paleo, the paleo literature, looking back uh, many, many millions of years ago is when plants emerged from the oceans, right? So they originally started, uh, started in the sea and then they came onto land and they ran into all sorts of different problems. So access to CO2 was now much easier. Because if you're in the water, if you're in the water, the diffusion of CO2 is really, really slow, and it takes a lot um, to pull any CO2 uh, out of the water. And this is sort of the what we call the, the the lily pad principle. So if you look at a lily pad, it's sitting on the water, and all the stomata are on the upper surface. There's no stomata, the the pores and the under, on the on the surface of the leaf that draw CO2 in. The pores on uh, the those the stomata pores are all on the top surface um, of a lily pad because the bottom side is covered in water, and the diffusion rate is so much lower. Right. So the lily pads have figured out that they can do much more photosynthesis and have a really, really big leaf um, by having all their stomata on the top, right? And so one of the trends is that um, 400 million years ago when this happened, there was really high CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, um, the temperature was really high, and plants had few stomata, um, and overheating was a really, really big problem. And so over time, uh, about 360 million years ago, CO2 is starting to decline. The CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is starting to decline, and the access then to CO2 is a problem. This should be a subscript and not a superscript, and I'll make a note of that to change that. Um, and, but basically what happened is these very early life, uh, these early, very early plant forms, these photosynthetic organisms that were on the planet started to change. And so this is kind of the, the, uh, the equivalent of um, a duck, right, getting the webbed feet, or Michael Phelps with the extra little skin in between his fingers, right, that makes him swim really, really fast. Um, this basically turns a set of cylinders, kind of bifurcating cylinders, this is what these plants look like millions and millions of years ago, and then transition to something that looks more like the leaf today. And this, probably happened around 360 million years ago, and basically every leaf that's on the planet now looks like this, following the exact same template. So plants very early on figured out that this kind of solution, the flat green form, right, the flat green sheet or the thin green sheet uh, was, the way, was the way to do it. This is a major advantage, um, and this worked really well, and any deviation from doing it this way uh, led to disastrous consequences and extinction probably. Okay, so when we think about water actually moving through the plant, um, 
and finally into the leaf. So up through the roots, through the trunk, out to the branch, through the petiole the, in the liquid form. And so the water is going in as a liquid and then eventually making its way into the teeny tiny veins. This is one of the, uh, a cleared leaf is what we call it. So we've bleached away all the chlorophyll and then stained it. And you can see all the veins that are in there. The water is going to go through one of these, uh, the mid vein of the leaf that we're all very familiar with. And then if you take a leaf and you look at it underneath, um, just hold it up to the light and you'll be able to see it. You don't even need a microscope. Um, you can see all these teeny tiny little pathways and these little little veins. And what they're doing is the veins are transporting the water through a relatively low resistance pathway. This is just pipes, plumbing, um, that's very, very efficient. And then the water emerges um, from one of these veins. This is kind of looking at it from a, a, a 90 degrees uh, view from above. This is basically from above. And if you turn that plane 90 degrees, you're looking at the xylem, right? So we remember xylem and phloem from our introductory biology classes many, many years ago. And so there's the xylem. And then the xylem, the, the xylem is transporting water in the liquid form. And then it has to diffuse um, and basically seep out from the, from the vasculature through all of the, the, the mesophyll cells. And these are all the cells here and all these little, little jelly beans that are kind of scattered around here should, would be green under normal conditions. And those are the chloroplasts. Those are what are doing the photosynthesis. And this is where the water has to trans uh, go through cell to cell. And it's very slow um, and inefficient. And then eventually it gets to this surface, right? This surface here. And then it makes the great leap uh, from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. And then eventually diffuses out of the leaf to the stomata. Right? Those are the little teeny tiny pores that can open and close that allow water vapor out, all those 400 water molecules out for every one CO2 molecule that comes in. And then CO2 basically goes through the opposite pathway. CO2 goes in, um, is absorbed by one of these cells, uh, converted, into, uh, converted into sugar, which then has to be go back through the same pathway and then get into the vasculature, but not in the xylem, but in the phloem instead, and then transport it out of the leaf. Right? So this part of the pathway um, ends up being really important. But this part, so the, how many stomata there are, the density of the stomata on a surface, so basically the number per square millimeter, is going to be very important for allowing water out and CO2 in. Um, the vein density is going to be very important as well um, in terms of getting the, the, the water as close as possible and sort of minimizing this high resistance pathway as possible. And that's actually what happened, um, sort of a, a, a trajectory towards that. Right? So if we look at time on the x-axis here, so this is deep time. We don't normally think about time on this um, unless you're into the paleo world. Um, but we're talking, what we're, what we're interested in is sort of the last 200 million years. Right? And so if we go back 200 million years ago, so we're fast forwarding from those really weird kind of odd leaves. If we go back 200 million years ago, what we, and we go out and do a census, a survey of all the plants that are on the planet. And this is biodiversity on the y-axis, or the percent of the species. We're mostly looking at ferns, so the pteridophytes and cycads. Ferns and cycads would be a really weird looking place um, compared to what we see today. Right? So the ferns and the cycads dominated in terms of species diversity and probably abundance too. Um, and there are a few seed plants, and then there are a lot of conifers. Right? There. And then over time, um, what happened is this, this explosion of the angiosperm diversity, right? So the angiosperms in green here and going uh, through sort of going through time and in particularly right around the Cretaceous. And then there's a second explosion right around this, the, 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 the boundary between um, the Cretaceous and the tertiary, right? This is what we often refer to as the KT boundary, um, where, there was an, where, where there was an additional explosion in the angiosperm diversity. And so one of the questions is, well, how? How did they do it? Right? So you have these other plants, right? the ferns and cycads and conifers, that were dominating the entire planet. And then in a very brief period of time, in terms of evolutionary time at least, um, the angiosperms completely take over the planet. So it's a really compelling story, and we don't have all the picture, we don't have all the pieces put together. What we know is happening at that time, depending on the model that you look at and the proxy data that you use, what we know is that during the Cretaceous, during this green sort of highlight, highlighted area, is that CO2 concentrations were going down. I mentioned that. And in response to that, one of the really interesting things is if you go back and you look at the fossil record and you can kind of reconstruct when uh, different events happened in terms of the, the evolution of the leaf and what the leaf looks like, is stomata went from being really big um, to really small. And they also went from being fairly few stomata to lots of stomata. Right? So remember the stomata are the pores that are letting uh, the CO2 in and the water vapor out. And it turns out that small stomata close, open and close much faster. Right? So if water is limiting, um, the plant wants to be really careful with, with how much, very conservative with how much water it uses. Um, but when they're open, uh, they want to be as efficient as possible in letting as much CO2 in um, and as much water out. And so as you go through evolutionary time and you look at all the different species, they're sort of the, the diversity in stomatal, uh, the, uh, the stomatal conductance goes up. Um, and the, the, the stomatal density goes, goes really, really high, right? So plants are taking advantage or figuring out that they are one of the constraints is that the CO2 concentration um, is dropping. And in response, they put 
basically poke more, more holes in the underside of the leaf. And the other thing that they did at the same time was to increase vein density. So if you go way back, the density of the veins, if you were to take a square millimeter, a square centimeter of vein, and sort of trace out the, the, the total length of vein that's there, um, basically what happens is that there's low vein density um, uh, back in these early plants 150, 175 million years ago. And then over time, uh, vein density has increased, is sort of the general, the general trend, right? So more and more veins mean the water gets closer and closer to the sites of evaporation, and it means that this kind of low, uh, high resistance pathway uh, is minimized, and that will allow more water to get out of the leaf, and then the, the plants to do more carbon, uh, uh, carbon fixation. And if you can get more carbon into your plant, you can make more leaves, you can make more seeds, and you basically come up with sort of the dominant, uh, dominant solution, and this is what the angiosperms did. But what we realized not too long ago is that there's a big missing piece. So we knew that in this leaf hydraulic pathway that I just showed you, the water goes in through the vein, it passes through the mesophyll. These are the cells that are doing photosynthesis and where all the evaporation um, of water is going on and the absorption of CO2 is going, goes through the mesophyll and then ultimately out the stomata. But there's a big missing part right in the middle, right? So we know that vein density went up and that increased the efficiency of the leaf in transporting water. We know that stomatal density went up and the stomatal size went down. That makes the plant very efficient at regulating the influx and efflux of water and CO2. Um, um, but what was going on with the mesophyll, right? So this is the big missing component of this, of this story and explaining why angiosperms in particular became so dominant on the planet, why they're able to have, achieve really, really high photosynthetic rates and, and outcompete all of these other plants that were once dominant uh, in the terrestrial <coughs> ecosystems. All right, so the, then the question is, so instead of why does a leaf look like a, look like a leaf, um, how can a leaf optimize CO2 and water exchange while satisfying all those other demands that I talked about, right? So if, this, if, the, if, if CO2 is dropping in the atmosphere and more CO2 into the, into the plant means a better plant and a more competitive plant, then how can, a, how can a plant modify itself, modify its structure, sort of its architecture, in order to optimize the uptake of CO2 um, while maintaining, uh, maintaining enough water and, and satisfying those demands, all right? So if we think about the inside of the leaf. One of the, one of the classic paradigms of uh, fundamental paradigms of biology is the surface area to volume ratio, okay? So we think about this, we do this every day. Everybody take a deep breath and exhale. All right, so we're all good. We're all feeling good, right? And so that's just air went into our lungs, all right? So the human lungs, this is a, this is a marvel of the sur surface area to volume ratio, right? So if you take the human lungs, 300 million alveoli or these little, these little parts, and if you take that and you spread it all out, right? So if you took all the surface area and calculated the surface area in the human lungs, the surface area is somewhere on the order of 50 to 70 square meters, right, for one set of lungs, right? And that just highlights the importance of, uh, of, this, of the surface area. So if we have a large surface area, that means we can pull more oxygen um, into, I don't know what happened there. Uh, that means, oh, thank you, it looks better. All right, so that, and it's gonna get, it's gonna look better. We're not gonna look at lungs all day. Um, that means that you can pour, pull more, uh, more oxygen out of the atmosphere and dump it into your blood, and that allows humans to have a really high um, uh, brain function and capacity for, I like it, I like it off, keep them off. Somebody, did somebody bump it back there? I think they did, all right. Uh, that happens, thank you. All right. No, all the way off, all the way off. <clears throat> all right, so human lung, right, so one, one set of lungs, 50 to 70 square meters, that's like half of a, half of a tennis court, right, in, in surface area. Ooh, now we're good, all right. Okay, so we thought, all right, well, maybe it's surface area, all right? So what we did is we went out and we looked through the literature. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, was that you again? I don't know, all right. So what we did is we went out through the, we went out through the literature and just kind of did a review and, and said, okay, what are the maximum photosynthetic rates? So this is the, the in micromoles per meter squared per second. So how much CO2, what's the maximum amount of CO2 that a plant can pull out of the atmosphere for a given surface area? And we're calculating surface area by looking at, you know, how much kind of cross-sectional area we're looking at and then how much, and then basically tracing the lines around these borders and figuring out how much surface area there is. And there's nothing, right? So this is just, you know, it just looks like somebody just, it's a shotgun, right, of, of just a, a huge spread in the data and very unsatisfying and very sad. Um, and so we cut, you know, we thought, oh, maybe this is it, maybe this is it, maybe this is the thing that people have been looking for in order to plug in that missing piece and like maybe plants are also doing this sort of a coordinated evolution of vein density and stomatal density um, and mesophyll surface area with maximizing the surface area to volume ratio. But it didn't, it didn't pan out. Um, and then so we thought, well, you know, we're, we think we're smart. Um, and we think we have good questions, and so maybe what if we've just been measuring it all wrong, right? So maybe we've just been thinking about this in, com in the completely wrong way. Um, because we weren't able to measure, uh, measure these traits um, in the way that are actually meaningful for a plant. And so 
Traditionally, the way this is done is you take your cross section of your leaf, right? So this is the vein in the middle, this is the palisade mesophyll, um, and this is the spongy mesophyll. This is basically acting like a sponge, which is why it's called the spongy mesophyll. It looks like a sponge and acts as like a sponge, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and letting water vapor out. Um, and so what you do is, is traditionally you would go in and you'd make all these different detailed measurements of, this, of the outlines of all these different cells and add that all up, and that's your, that's your surface area. Um, but what we know is that, that's, that, that plants don't necessarily look like this. Um, and the reason um, that we probably got this wrong to begin with, and the way that we're, we, and we're thinking about this in the wrong way, is that this is sort of a two-dimensional cross-section that you would get from a light microscopy slide. So you take a, take a leaf, make a really, really thin section, put it on a microscope slide, and this is what you would see, right? You've got the epidermis, you've got the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf, you've got the guard cells that form the stomata, <clears throat> the stomatal pore, and then you've got all these cells, the photosynthetic material in the veins, and then we often, this this is like the most detailed one that I could find, this sort of three-dimensional view of what a leaf actually looks like. But it turns out that the three-dimensional view, our cartoon sort of version of the leaf as it's presented in introductory biology classes, um, is all inferred from a two-dimensional perspective. Okay? Um, and we think that that's probably led us down a bunch of wrong and dead ends um, in interpreting what the, what the leaf actually looks like on the inside. All right, so one of the things that we've done, we've been working on sort of uh, uh, using this new technology to basically do a 3D imaging of, of plants. And we've done this quite a bit with a number of different um, uh, plant species, I've usually focused on roots and stems uh, and trunks over the last probably 10 years or so, and trying to understand sort of the functional, the functional uh, status of the vascular network as it's exposed to drought. And then what we started to realize is that as this, as this uh, technology has sort of matured and as we've refined our methods for uh, doing all the image processing, we can now take advantage and start to look at leaves um, and then actually measure the, the actual surface area of the inside of the leaf um, for a given volume of leaf tissue instead of a cross-sectional area. And so what we use is that it's called X-ray computed tomography or microcomputed tomography, um, CT scanning, and it's basically just a three-dimensional X-ray. And this is based on the same medical principles, uh, same, principle, uh, same principles as a medical CT system. So if you had something that happened to your body um, and you needed to get a, a the, the doctor wanted to get a three-dimensional scan, they might pair it up with some sort of uh, dye tracer that would allow you to figure out um, what, was wrong, uh, what was wrong with a certain part of your body. Um, and basically what a CT scan is, hundreds of standard X-ray images, but just taken at different angles um, and a whole bunch of math. Uh, that, uh, that allow you to get kind of a three-dimensional image of, of what you're trying to study. And so we're using the same um, type of instrument, but it works at a much, much smaller scale. So the, the medical CT units are kind of like a big donut um, and sort of look like an MRI as well, but uh, they're a little bit smaller, and you lay on, this, uh, lay on this platform and you slide in. So we're basically doing the same thing, um, same thing with plants, except we're doing ours <clears throat> at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And this is probably one of maybe two or three places in the world that, can, that can actually do the type of imaging that we want. And so it's a synchrotron particle accelerator facility, and one of these little um, uh, arms off of here, so there's, there's uh, high, uh, high energy um, photons and um, racing around uh, the racing around this ring, and they do all sorts of interesting particle accelerator physics and things like that um, there. And there's also one of the beam, what they call a beam line here, uh, where they shuttle off some of the X-rays that are produced by this instrument. Uh, we can use that to do uh, do these do this X-ray imaging. And so this is what it looks like from the inside. It's about the so size of a um, almost the size of um, kind of a soccer stadium. It's really it's it's huge. Um, and then in there, there's this metal hutch, um, and then inside this lead-lined hutch, because there's a lot of X-rays and we need to be careful. Um, there's a, a rotating stage. The x-rays come out of here and pass through our sample, which we um, have a highly sophisticated sample mounting system, which ends up being just being a plastic uh, pipette tip uh, that costs like a penny a piece. Um, but it turns out to be the perfect sample holder. Um, and this is something that, that Adam Roddy in my lab uh, and Mason Earls and then Guillaume Thierry Rincourt um, have been working on over the past couple of years in developing this method as a way to visualize and kind of see the leaf in 3D. Right? So up until now, we've basically been using two-dimensional methods for asking questions about a three-dimensional problem. Right? So we need a three-dimensional approach to doing this. Um, so we'll take our leaf, the, this is just kind of a, a brief overview of what we're doing. We take our leaf, um, we cut out a piece, and then we take it and we wrap it in some um, x-ray transparent tape that keeps the leaf um, basically in its, in its uh, original state. Right? And so in this way, we don't have to do any of the, the dehydration or, the, the, or any of the other sample preparation uh, that you would need to do with traditional histology and microscopy um, that might lead to um, uh, some measurement error. We take that, we put it into our, our sophisticated uh, sample holder, our pipette tip, we mount it in the instrument, and then we get basically thousands and thousands of cross sections um, for a given you know, final volume. And the, the data that ends up coming out um, ends up for like each leaf, it's probably five to 10 gigabytes worth of data. 
<clears throat> and so data processing and, uh, and, and management ends up becoming a, a major problem for us. And, and this is something that, that Guillaume and Mason in particular have been focusing on figuring out ways to get the computer to do a lot of this work. And so what it's, what it's required of us is to basically teach the computer plant anatomy, leaf anatomy, so that it can automatically go through these thousands and thousands and thousands of images and pull out what we think are the important parts and doing it in an appropriate way. And so we get cross sections through the leaf and it goes through a bunch of different image processing steps. And then we basically have this kind of exploded parts diagram of, of what a leaf is, right? So for the for, essentially for the first time. Um, and what we've got is this is all the leaf material here. This is all the airspace that I was talking about. So it's sort of the inverse of the, all the leaf tissue, right? Um, and does that look like that cartoony sort of three dimensional like cartoon of a leaf? No, it doesn't. It looks completely different. We've been wrong, right, for years. All right, which is surprising. And I showed, this, I showed this to Erica Edwards the other day, and she just, she's in the back, and she just, you know, mind exploded because like, the leaf doesn't look anything like I thought it did, right? Um, I thought a leaf looked a certain way. I thought it looked like this, right? And it doesn't look like that. And I'll show you in just a minute what it actually does look like. All right, and so we can pull things out like the total surface area of the leaf. We can actually measure it now. Um, in a way that's never been before possible. And we can measure the total amount of airspace, and we can talk about things related to the distribution of that airspace and why it's important. And we can pull out things like the vasculature as well. So pull out these different components um, and think about them critically um, in trying to figure out why a leaf looks like a leaf. All right, so I'm gonna do this, and I hope it works. All right, so what it looks like, and I will do this. We're gonna move over, okay, it worked, awesome. All right, so this, anybody eating lunch? In, eating a sandwich? Or ate a sandwich, who had spinach today? Ate a piece of spinach. Nobody? One, two, three, four, a few people. How many people have eaten spinach? All right, all right, everybody. All right, so this is a common species. All right, so this is, this is what the inside of a spinach leaf looks like. All right, so you've seen spinach from the outside, um, certainly. Um, but this is what spinach, a spinach, piece of spinach looks on the outside. So this is top to bottom, so I've flipped it over intentionally. So this is the top of the leaf, and this is the bottom of the leaf, and I'll tell you why I did that in just a minute. Um, these are the palisade cells, which are those long column-shaped cells, and these are the spongy mesophyll cells that we were just talking about. And certainly, if you were to look at just this face that sort of you're looking at, and these kind of darker outlines, I can totally understand how you would arrive at the sort of generic little, you know, spheroid sort of um, uh, spongy mesophyll paradigm that, that, that we see. But the, fir the first thing, and I hope this will work, um, is that we can zoom in and we can look at this leaf from the inside and we can fly in, all right? All right? And so you can see that the inside of the leaf um, is much more complicated uh, than we originally thought. And so we have no idea um, at the moment what this diversity actually means, what it actually looks like, and how much diversity there's in the inside of the leaf. So if you look at all those leaves that I put up on the screen, all those different species from E.L. Myers, there is that diversity on the outside, but there's also this incredible amount of diversity on the inside that is equally important. So in terms of conservation, perhaps, um, we wanna conserve a particular species because it plays a particular role in the habitat. But there's all this amazing diversity on the inside and the degree of plasticity, we are still trying to wrap our heads around and trying to figure out what it all means, right? So this is all very new. You're probably, we've now at least doubled or tripled the number of people that have now seen what the inside of a leaf actually looks like, right? Just by sitting in this room because this is so new. Um, and the, my students actually in my, in my plant physiology class uh, just got to see this yesterday and they just, they wouldn't put the thing down. They wanted that, some of them ended up being late to class, I think. But it ends up, to their next class, right? So you look around and you spin this thing around, um, and one of the things that, that we'll do, I'll show you how you can do this and play around this, play around with this um, at the end of at the end of the, at the end of the seminar, right? So that's what the inside of the leaf looks like. Um, uh oh, all right, there we go, we're back, cool. All right, so <clears throat> back enough spinny things. Um, so we've, now we can measure things like leaf porosity um, that were otherwise really, really difficult. There's ways to do it before, but it was really, really hard, and there was potentially a lot of measurement error um, that we weren't quite sure of. So a lot of uncertainty, and so I think we're now a little bit more certain um, about a lot of these measurement, uh, measurements, right? So we've got cross-section of the leaf. This is a micro CT scan, just a single slice. We've got cells, we've got airspace, we've got the stomata, um, and we've got all the different parts, and we can look at it in 3D, these three-dimensional volumes, and we can figure out where all this stuff is. Um, we can look at leaf tissue, we can look at the airspace and kind of how the airspace is distributed, and we actually measure the surface area 
um, of the leaf for a given volume instead of a cross-sectional area, which is a really important major advancement um, in our ability to understand plants. And so now, we're, instead of looking at it in square microns per square micron of tissue, we're looking at it you know, as a, how much surface area is on the inside um, for a given volume of, of tissue. We can also measure all sorts of other things, right? So we can measure the percent of the airspace that's disconnected from the main airspace, and this, we'll talk about this in a minute, why this is important. Um, we can also talk about path length and tortuosity of this path uh, of the vapor diffusion pathway, either CO2 getting to the, uh, getting to the cells where the photosynthesis is taking place, or the water vapor that's, that's coming out, and do this sort of in real time and do some really interesting modeling exercises that I'll get to um, at the end. Um, but this is kind of a major, uh, a major um, uh, advancement for us as well, because these terms had always been sort of assumed or not, it, it's just things that you could not measure um, before we started to do this. All right. So, what we wanted to do um, is think about just a simple hypothesis and look at two different groups of plants, CAM plants and C3 plants. So three, C3 plants are the ones that do photosynthesis like most of the organisms that you, if you walk outside, most of the plants out there are doing C, what's called C3 photosynthesis. It's a very common bio, a biochemical pathway that plants use to do photosynthesis and it's dependent on having a really high absorption rate of CO2 and as a consequence a really high uh, water loss. CAM plants do things a little bit differently um, in that they, uh, they, will, they will accumulate CO2 at night um, and then store it away as a different molecule and then use it later on um, during the day. And these plants are typically, the, and, and we're going to use bromeliads, the, the, the bromeliad group, um, as a way to, to make these comparisons because we have C3 plants and CAM plants both in the same group and very closely related, and then make some comparisons between the two. And so we would expect that the C3 plants should have a high surface area, lots of airspace to optimize CO2 uptake, and CAM plants should have a lower air surface area, less airspace, uh, less airspace in order to optimize um, CO2, uh, CO2 storage. They need to have really, really big cells to store, uh, uh, store the sugars or the sugar um, um, analog molecule in order to, to store it for a long period of time and then also to minimize water loss. They want to do the exact opposite of C3 plants. They're going in a really hot environment without much water. They want to be as careful with their water as possible and so they don't want to have, they want to do the opposite of what a C3 plant does. Um, and basically what we wanted to do is go in and figure out what does this vapor diffusion pathway actually look like and calculate all the surface area. Right? So you can take a leaf, this is, an, uh, this is acmia, this is, uh, this is a, just a piece of it, right? and you can kind of look at it and spin it around, um, and what this one is going to do is you can see how complicated, again, this doesn't look anything like our, our, our kind of generalized cartoon from the biology textbooks or even the botany textbooks. Um, we're going to go through and we can fly through one of the stomatal pores and we can think about what is the kind of the maximum uh, pathway, the pa what is the path length and how tortuous is that pathway um, for getting to um, where the CO2 might be absorbed on the inside of the leaf, because that is really important. That is going to be the fundamental trait that determines whether or not if the plant can make um, this pathway as efficient as possible, then it's going to be able to pull in more CO2 um, and, and do, better, uh, do better at photosynthesis. All right? So we took 19 different species, um, 19, in the, 19 bromeliads, all in the same, uh, all in the same plant family, um, uh, lumped them into two different groups, CAM plants and C3 plants, um, and then had trained, or basically had to use our software and, and teach it plant anatomy so that it could go through and automate all, uh, a lot of this process in picking out the intercellular airspace and white, um, the, meso the, bundle, the vascular tissue and the bundle sheath, which is just the, basically the veins, and then all the rest of the cells, the mesophyll cells, and this is just a single slice to illustrate kind of what's going on. And one of the things that's immediately apparent is that these C3 plants, right, have this huge, really large, open um, uh, central airspace, and then the CAM plants have the vascular system sort of distributed in all sorts of different ways, and we think that at least this is in part because bromeliads often don't follow this flat green sheet. Right, uh, paradigm, right? So they've deviated that away from that in order to adapt to these really dry, um, high light environments, right? And so what we can do is then we can take a leaf, right? And these, all these little arrows point to the stomatal inlets on the bottom so underside of the leaf, and we can start to calculate things like the surface area on the inside, or we can talk about the vapor path length. So basically how long um, would it take for a CO2 molecule entering the leaf to get to where it needs to go, right? So it's gonna have a longer and longer path length, and this, the length of this, the, the, the vapor path length is going to directly influence the the plant's ability to, to uptake CO2. And what we find in the CAM plants in particular is because the cells have gotten so big, right, so they get bigger and bigger and bigger, basically squeezing out all the air, right, and all the airspace. And that's disconnecting a lot of these little airspaces in the top of the leaf and making it really hard for any of the cells near the top of the leaf to do any photosynthesis. And indeed, when you look at the, as the vapor path length gets, it gets longer and longer and longer, the, the leaf actually stops putting chlorophyll stops putting chloroplasts in these cells, probably because the, the, the amount of CO2 that it can actually reach because of that 10,000 times slower diffusion gradient um, penalty 
they have. They basically stop. They use these for water storage, and then they stop putting chloroplasts in them because there's just not enough CO2 to make it worth it. Because all those cells in the inside, uh, are, uh, each of those cells in the inside of a leaf, you know, to keep them alive, there's respiration and there's a cost involved in doing that. So we can take our 3D data kind of and then collapse it back into 2D and produce what we, these kind of uh, heat maps and basically look at all of these different um, traits of these different CAM and C3 plants and start to look at them in, in, in very new ways. Um, and if we look at the porosity um, of CAM versus C3 plants, the porosity is way higher, right? So if you look at all of these CAM or C3 plants down here, the need to optimize that surface area to volume ratio, they, they seem to be doing it, right? A big inter, uh, internal airspace, and there's very little, dis, uh, very few parts of the, of the leaf that are actually disconnected from the main airspace. And then CAM plants are doing something very different, right? So there, there tends to be like a little pocket, and then there's all uh, there's a lot of the, the a lot of the leaf is actually disconnected. Um, and this is that this disconnected airspace, the the, the close closer to the white color that, that you see on there, um, the more disconnected the airspace is, and then functionally renders those parts of the leaf um, non-photosynthetic or, or very, very inefficient. And so in the case of cam plants, that's probably okay. They have relatively low photosynthetic rates. They're just trying to get by um, in, a really, in a really hot environment, right? Um, and so two very different strategies. Um, for living in a dry habitat, and because of, they're living essentially in the same habitat, uh, but they've gone through uh, uh, through, ev uh, through evolutionary time, have diverged into either being a cam plant with a very different biochemical pathway, and so have um, the the form of the the leaf then looks very different in order to maximize um, uh, their or optimize the, the photosynthesis, doing cam photosynthesis, doing doing C3. And we look at some of these other terms, the two, the two different groups, the C3 plants and the CAM plants, sort of separate out into these two different groups. If we talk about tortuosity, um, we talk about lateral path lengthening and air, uh, airspace connectivity, um, the two different groups fall out into two different kind of trait spaces um, uh, for all these, different, and, uh, all these different parameters in terms of the mesophyll surface area, um, which, is, which is really interesting and sort of what we expected uh, in this case study. And what's really interesting thing, what the really interesting thing about CAM plants is that we think that they're probably at, they've, they've done the absolute best in the sort of at, the, you know, how, what's the sort of evolutionary trajectory for these particular traits. Um, and it looks like, so, the, so C3 plants are kind of in this domain in terms of porosity. Um, this would be a porosity of zero where all the airspace is squeezed out. You never see plants that look like this because that's just would be a very bad way to put together a plant. Um, and this is where the, por, where the pore space is um, all uh, 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 entirely connected, but these leaves are sort of floating in three-dimensional space um, and not connected to it at all, and this would probably wouldn't arise unless you were maybe growing plants in space or something like that, but even then it still wouldn't work. Um, most plants fall in sort of this range between 0.12 um, and 0.5. So this is sort of the realm of reality um, from here to here, and this is where the C3 plants um, uh, are, are located. And then the CAM plants are over here, where they have basically squeezed out as much of the airspace as absolutely possible. And this is a, this is a simulation of the total amount of malic acid or that, that, that compound that, plants use, that CAM plants use to store away the carbon until they can actually, the, the CO2 until they can actually use it. And and the maximum rate happens to fall um, based on our model predictions right in that zone. And so C3 plants are probably, in terms of the, the clustering of the cells and how large the cells are, um, and putting together the inside of the leaf in terms of the surface area to volume ratio, op perfectly optimized for doing CAM photosynthesis. And then the C3 plants don't exist sort of in this, this, this porosity domain simply because it would make them a terrible C3 plant, right? Because the, the, they need to uh, do something completely different with the maintaining their, their surface area to volume ratio. So that was really cool. And then what we started to do is we went back to this very disappointing data set that I mentioned earlier, um, looking at surface area uh, in terms of uh, uh, meter squared of, uh, micro, micrometer squared of surface area per micrometer squared of, of leaf that you're actually looking at, and then looking at the maximum photosynthetic rate. And then we move it over here and we actually measure it on a per volume basis, um, measuring the trait in three dimensions. And then all of a sudden we get this really great relationship. So this is an R squared of 0.25. <coughs> if you're in bio, biology and ecology, and you can, you're able to get an R squared of 0.25. So basically, we can now explain 25% of the variability in the maximum photosynthetic rate with one trait, right? It's a mesophyll surface area, right? So, which is really amazing. There's a paper published in Science, like last year, they had an R squared of 0.28 or something like that, right? Because it was just talking about uh, leaf size and sort of patterns, of global patterns of leaf size. So you get really, really excited um, about an R squared of 0.25, and there's more data to add to this, and it's going to get better and better. Right, so we can kind of now explain and sort of fill in uh, that, missing, that missing part. Right, so if we look at the, a, the, the area of the mesophyll for a given volume of mesophyll tissue, um, we look at the angiosperms and we can look at the gymnosperms um, and we can look at the ferns and sort of breaking, breaking
breaking these um, into three different bins. The angiosperms have explored this huge amount of trait space, right? So they go from really, really low um, uh, surface area to volume ratio to really, really high. Um, and, they, and, and the gymnosperms, right, so these plants that were historically dominant on the planet, um, are evolutionary kind of in a dead end. They're stuck for whatever reason they haven't been able to break out and take advantage and optimize the surface area to volume ratio. Right? Um, and there's even some, some of the ferns have started to play around with this. And there's these xeric ferns that live in dry habitats. They look a little bit more like an angiosperm. Um, and then one of the interesting things is if you break down the angiosperms and look at this, this trait diversity, you look at cam plants and they're low, right? That's what you'd expect based on the sort of the model simulations that we just showed. And that cam plants want to be, have a really, low, a really low value here. And then the C3 and C4 plants um, are the ones that are making up a lot of this diversity. And then if you look at just the monocots and break those down into cam versus C4, and C3, you see this huge range in diversity. Um, and in particular, um, these C3 and C4 grasses have just kind of exploded in, the, in, in trait space. Um, and, and we think that's one of the big reasons why they've been able to be, uh, uh, become dominant in almost every terrestrial habitat on Earth. Right, and out competing all these other species. Right? So we've got this. We think that, that surface area, mesophyll surface area, like the, the breadth or the diversity in mesophyll surface area has also gone up over this evolutionary time. But then Mason and Guillaume and I were thinking about it. Um, and then how did they do it? Right? And so the, the, if I ever have a question now in the lab um, after working with Adam, uh, Roddy is a, a Yibs postdoc uh, in the lab. Um, I ask, I ask, I ask Adam. Right? So ask Adam Roddy is, 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 the, all the, is the question is the is the thing to do because Adam has a really cool way of thinking about the world, um, and it's it, you know, the, one of the one of the great things about working at FES is that you get to work you know interact with all these really amazing people. So I asked Adam, what do you think? And he said, oh, it's genome size, or cell size. Um, and Adam had this really cool paper with a colleague at, uh, at San Francisco State <clears throat> University last year uh, that sort of un what I think is underappreciated. Uh, and what they found is this really cool relationship between the, the size of the genome, the size of the DNA, right, that's in each and every one of the cells, and the maximum and the maximum and minimum cell size. And so by having a, little, a smaller and smaller and smaller genome, by streamlining the genome, that means you can have a physically smaller cell size. So smell and, and cell size, so smaller cells basically means greater surface area for CO2 uptake. And indeed, if you look at the surface area to volume ratio and look at mesophyll cell diameter, right, so there's a really strong relationship between these two. So if, as your mesophyll cell diameter gets smaller and smaller and smaller, your surface area to volume ratio skyrockets, right? It allows you to absorb so much more CO2 from the atmosphere and do much, much higher, photo, uh, much more photosynthesis. And if you look at this in terms of genome size, all of the plants um, that have really small uh, mesophyll cell diameters are, are, are species with small genomes, right? And so this sort of idea and this clustering of ideas, pairing up Adam's idea, um, Adam and Kevin Simonon's idea of looking at the relationship between genome size and cell size, um, and then putting it together with all these other traits um, led to this, the, the grant that many of you uh, probably heard, and there was a big announcement on Monday um, about this new Rules of Life uh, NSF grant that we got to sort of explore some of these ideas in a bunch of these different plants with biochemical pathways. So we think, and I don't like using this term um, because it's ultimately going to probably be hopefully proven somewhat dis, uh, disproven at some point. But we think we found kind of a unifying theory for explaining the optimization of exchange for water and CO2 in plants. There's basically just this big question mark sitting in the middle. And we think it's controlled by cell size. The smaller the cell size, the more surface area to volume ratio you can have um, and optimizing that. And ultimately, that is probably determined by genome size. And genome size is something that we can probably manipulate in the future. Right? So if we're thinking about gene editing and pulling out all the parts of the gene that don't matter, then maybe we can get cells to produce small, uh, to, to, to get leaves to produce uh, cells of smaller size, or then we can start to play around with things and then maybe cause plants to have um, higher productivity, higher yields in our, in our crop species uh, and things like that. But wait, there's more, right? So this, it doesn't stop there, right? So that was cool, um, but there's more. And I just got done telling you about how most plant physiologists are sort of siloed into their own world. Right? Um, and we just talked about the fact that the leaf is being pulled in all sorts of different directions from a functional perspective and, and, and kind of morphological perspective. Um, but what's also interesting is that we don't know, so there's got to be some trade-offs, right? So if a leaf goes through all this effort to basically increase the surface area, of, surface area to volume ratio on the inside of the leaf, um, what is kind of the, what, are, what are the consequences for things like light absorption for thing, uh, and for other traits, All right? So this is, so what else is, what else is surface area good for? And this is a project that I wanted to highlight really just really briefly. It's sort of in its initial stages. 
Um, this, is a, this is work that's been done by Alec Borsak. She's an MESC um, uh, student in my lab right now and is working on uh, the optics of, of, of these different tissue types. So we, I remember we've got those palisade cells that look like long skinny cells and we've got these um, in, the, in the palisade tissue in the upper parts of the leaf and in the lower parts of the leaf where all the surface area um, that we've just been talking about in these small, si uh, small cell sizes um, are located for the optimizing CO2 uptake. Well, what does that mean for processing light, right? Because the leaf has to also process light and it's going to be influenced by the shape of the cells. And so Alec has been working on some really cool stuff. We're simulating basically the rays coming in and doing for this for the first time in three dimensions and figuring out, well, what, you know, there's been some theories about how these different cell types um, perform in terms of transporting, uh, uh, transporting light through the leaf. And what she's found is that indeed this, this, this theory holds up um, where the palisade cells tend to act as kind of light pipes and channeling light deeper and deeper into the leaf. And then the spongy mesophyll cells sort of act as light diffusers. So not only does decreasing the cell size increase increase the ability of the plant to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, but it also influences the, the, the ability of the, the leaf to sort of scatter light and trap as much of it as absolutely possible. Right? So thinking about things in terms of not just siloing yourself um, in one kind of field and sort of thinking about leaf form and function from a, a bunch of different approach, approaches um, based on kind of these competing demands for why a leaf might look like a leaf. All right? So now what she's doing um, is taking these three-dimensional CT scans. These are sort of models. Um, modeled kind of toys, uh, toy leaf cells, and then actually pulling out, the, uh, pulling out the, the actual cell structure on the inside of the leaf, and then running these simulations to figure out whether or not, um, and testing some of these hypotheses, okay, so if you have a leaf that has a really thick palisade layer with these cells, um, what does that actually mean? So we're kind of pushing into these new areas um, that basically have never been before possible because we just hadn't had access to um, kind of the, the complexity of the internal geometry of, of, of leaves. Um, and then in terms of biomechanics, so what does it mean, right? So a leaf has to be flexible, it has to be rigid, it has to hold itself up. So if you start to shrink cells and move them in different directions or have really big cells, what does that do for biomechanics, right? So if you look at other examples in, in, in nature, right? So this is, a, this is an old image from a metacarpal bone from a vulture's wing, um, stiffened after the manner of a warren's truss. Right? And so this is the inside of a vulture wing. Um, and in order to, you know, we know that birds have really, really lightweight, um, lightweight bones, and that, of course, allows them to fly. Right? And so basically taking advantage of some of these mechanical, uh, mechanical terms and working with a group from the School of Engineering, um, and Adam as well, Adam Roddy again, um, working through this YIBS-funded EF3 program, um, looking at the evolution of flower form and function and, and also in, in relation to leaves, um, we're starting to look at things, and so what are the biomechanical influence uh, implications of putting together a leaf in this way? So there's all sorts of different things um, and, and compromises and constraints. So we think that the increased mesophyll surface area, so probably increases the water vapor movement, right? So water out, and that means that it also increases the CO2 absorption, pulling CO2 in. It optimizes the internal light scattering, perhaps. We're testing that right now, and there's probably a role in leaf biomechanics. And in this way, uh, we think that we can now produce a new sort of integrated view of the three-dimensional leaf, both from the intracellular organization, because now we can do this micro CT imaging or a CT or 3D imaging um, at the inside of the cell cell, like inside of individual cells. Um, we can do it for all the things that we were just talking about um, in the intracellular level and then the tissue level organization, kind of thinking, thinking about things in a very integrated, integrated way. Um, we're also doing this in virtual reality. This is, um, and looking at things just like you did with looking on the, looking in the screen, um, we're exploring leaves in virtual reality. This is Graham Farquhar. Those of you that know anything about um, uh, plant physiology, know this guy's name, so he's a Kyoto Prize uh, laureate um, and one of the people responsible for kind of the primary uh, uh, equation that we use for estimating photosynthesis. So he's in here. Um, if you don't get excited about uh, Graham Farquhar, you might get excited about Secretary Rick Perry um, because the, the facility that we use um, is funded by the Department of Energy. And so Rick Perry came out um, and did a site visit. That's our poster in the background um, of some of the work that we do. And there's Rick Perry with the, three, with the 3D virtual reality goggles, and he's looking at one of our samples, right? So he's in there. And I think one of the, one of the things that really came out from Justin's talk last week is that we're living in this time of increasing sort of information and misinformation. And it's our job as scientists to do a really good job of communicating what we find is important about plants and sort of diversity um, or in terms of biofuels that the, the Department of Energy is in, interested in and then funding this large scale facility. The fact that we can get Rick Perry to come and sit down and put on a 3D pair of glasses and look at the inside of leaves or look at the inside of plants I think is really, is really powerful, right? Because these are the people that end up making the decisions that influence the rest of us, right? Okay. And so what I want to do, and the last thing that I want to leave you with, is that if you liked that three-dimensional leaf, one thing that you can do is if you have an iPhone, um, you can go here and you can open your camera app, 
um, at least in the newer versions of the operating system, you can scan this, it will automatically detect this QR code, and it'll load up a website that has this, and you can actually, everybody's got their phone up, I should take a picture. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually download, uh, that, go to a website that will allow you to download this model, and you can pinch and zoom and, three, and zoom in in 3D and look at this um, on your own time. And I can send out a link or we can figure out a way to get it. And if you're ever interested, you're feel free to, uh, feel free to walk by my office and stop in and say, hey, I wanna look at the inside of a spinach leaf, because I've got a, a virtual reader a virtual reality headset just sitting around um, waiting for people to play with it. We were using it in class yesterday, it was a blast, um, and we're doing this all the time in my classes. All right, so thinking back to the lungs, right? Um, and that's like a very, very personal thing. It's, it's something that for all of us, and I did the back of the envelope calculation this morning, um, and, I think I'm, and, I, and I think I'm right. Um, and so this red maple leaf that we started off at the beginning of the lecture um, is about 40, maybe 40 square centimeters in surface area. Um, and that would have, if based on our new calculations, would probably have um, about 1,400 uh, square centimeters of internal uh, surface area, right? And that, so that one leaf, right, might have 0.14 square meters of surface area on the inside. Um, if you take, which doesn't sound like a lot in terms of a pair of lungs. Um, and if you, but if you multiply that for maybe a medium-sized tree of about 1,000 leaves, you get 140 square meters of surf total surface area on that one tree, which is an amazing amount, right? And it's about the size of a tennis court which is pretty cool. All right, so I've got a lot of acknowledgements, a bunch of people to thank, there's not enough time to do it. Um, and I just wanted to thank my lab in particular, um, all the, the great collaborators at UC Davis um, and at, at Berkeley, our funding from YIBS and the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, um, and a lot, a lot of other great people, Kevin Boyce at Stanford, um, who helped out with kind of a lot of the paleo uh, uh, work and, and, and kind of thinking, and Dan Johnson, of course, um, who's also part of one of my other NSF grants that I didn't have a chance to talk about today. Um, but I'll leave you with that, so thank you. So I'd be happy to take any questions if I know we're just about out of time. Shui. So early are you, um... you, you, you imply that uh, diffusion, efficiency, uh, uh, difference between air and, and water may have played a role in shaping the morphology of a leaf. And later on, you, you bring in uh, cam plants and showing the contrast between cam plants and, and C3 plants. There's a group of plants growing in water, aquatic plants growing underwater, underwater that also are CAM. Mm. And of course, they have very low diff uh, the diffusivity, so it's a huge obstacle, right. but they don't need to conserve water. I mm -hmm. wonder if you can explain, th th their, their leaf morphology are almost like the same as we see on, on dry plant leaves. Yeah, so there's, um, one, of the, one of the things, and what's hard to tease apart from all of this is, is kind of understanding sort of the evolutionary history about where, like how those plants evolved. Did they start on land, did they migrate back into the water, um, or did they stay in water the entire time? Um, and so there's, in, in a lot of these species, there's a lot of evolutionary kind of baggage that goes along with it, and trying to tease that apart is, it can be generally uh, pretty hard. Um, and certainly growing underwater is, um, um, is, is difficult in terms that you, just, that you just mentioned, in terms of bringing in CO2. Um, one of the things, so I, we did measure kind of the maximum photosynthetic rate and, and plotted that against the, the surface area to volume ratio there. Um, and what, I'd, what I want to point out and what I want to make sure that, that is clear is that maximum photosynthetic rate doesn't, isn't, isn't the, 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 the absolute trait that you need to, to win um, and to outcompete. Right? So in, in many cases, you just need a, fo a photosynthetic rate that's good enough right, to outcompete all the rest of your neighbors. And so there's probably some trade-offs between there. There's other structural things that, that, an, that an aquatic plant would need to do, um, and there's therefore some sort of a compromise in the way that, that a leaf is put together. So I don't have a good answer for your question, but I tried to dance around it there and sort of, um. <laughs> Anything else? In the back. So to me, one of the things that jumped out the most in comparing like the 2D versus the 3D image of the leaf is that in a 2D cross-section, the spongy mesophyll looks like round blobs, but in this, it looks more like it's kind of stringy. So I was wondering, is that, is that changing our picture of the shape of spongy mesophyll cells, or are those sort of like strings, actually several cells stuck together? But either way, like what do you think you can is the significance of that structure? Yeah, so there, um, uh, there, there certainly are some plants that have the kind of the spheroid paradigm, right? So a lot of those cam plants, it turns out, they, you know, they look 
pretty sphery, especially in the top part of the leaf where the water storage is going on, where they really need to just be a big um, uh, bag of water, essentially. But the, the rest of these, and e but even in, those, even in those species, even in those succulent plants, when you get down into the spongy mesophyll, it starts to look really weird. Um, I don't have a good answer for you because we've just started looking into this. And we, I mean, this was, the, this was the first one that I really started to poke around in and spend some time kind of thinking inside the leaf and just, it's just not what we thought. Um, so I don't know, I don't know, I don't have a good answer for that. I, um, we're, we're sort of working on it. Um, the inside, it turn, Adam has been doing a lot of work on flowers and it turns out the inside of flowers looks just like the spongy mesophyll, there's no palisade. Um, and they're kind of doing very different things. Um, and so we're thinking about that in terms of kind of the biomechanics. Um, certainly there's a couple of uh, spots where you can see there's a cell wall there, um, there's a cell wall there. Um, and so the cells, the mesophyll cells don't, at least in a lot of the species that we looked at, don't look anything like the textbooks. But we wouldn't have known, right? So other, uh, uh, the only way that you would know is by doing thousands and thousands of cross sections by hand and sort of reconstructing it in your mind. And it's a very painstaking, uh, tedious, uh, 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 tedious task to do that, right? For, for one leaf and sectioning it perfectly thousands and thousands of times. Um, it just is really, something's really difficult to do without this technology. So if I'm a person that believes in biomimicry, mm -hmm. Who, who, who wants to get inspiration from this leaf. And I want to fix CO2 and, and transform CO2 and do it selectively aside from all the other gases and things like that. What is this leaf, what are these insights teaching me on how to do it better? Right, so in, in, in this case in particular, just because given that, that ratio, right, that exchange rate of 400 to one, um, there's, there, there may be some things that, you know, if we were able to manipulate, m manipulate this in a certain way, just by tweaking the, that surface area to volume ratio, we, we might make a leaf that ends up leaking way too much water and becomes a, a bad plant. It doesn't do it the right way. Um, and so certainly from this perspective, or from the perspective of the lungs, um, that's just some, one of this kind of underlying biological principles is the surface area to volume ratio. So if you can maximize that, so if you're thinking about trying to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, which plants are really, really good at, um, uh, then this is, you know, this, this type of kind of organization, um, and in particular the species that are really on that far end of, the, the, of that trade space that have really maximized this is sort of where you would want to go. Right? But it may not be this. It may be other some sort of porous media um, that you that you might want to go at. But at least in evolutionary terms, plants have been thinking about this. There's 400 million years of research and development, um, and so that have gone into the putting it, you know, turning a leaf into this. And so we should probably start paying attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that we gotta we gotta wrap it up. I think that somebody told me we had to stop. <laughs> All right. Thank you.